Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here for what promises to be an interactive, engaging, a provocative, and an interesting session. Uh, we hope to make this a conversation about uh, the potential that, uh, that we see as far as the circular economy is concerned, what the challenges are, and what we need to do on several fronts to be able to realize the objectives. I was looking at a report that was put out by Accenture uh, on taking advantage in a circular economy, and they've put down some numbers. Uh, Accenture's research indicates a 4.5 trillion reward for achieving sustainable businesses by 2030. They talk about not just waste in the traditional sense, but also about the enormous underutilization of natural resources. Uh, it also then goes on to talk about eliminating the concept of waste and recognizing that everything has a value and how that incorporates itself into a viable, profitable business model. Uh, that is what we intend to focus on today. We've got a, a great lineup of uh, panelists here joining us today. Today, let me introduce you to them. Privahini Bradu, founder CEO of Blue Oak, in fact, just raised, what, $40 million to build mini refineries to recycle high-value metals from e-waste. Thank you very much for joining us here on the panel. Jasper Broden, CEO of IKEA. IKEA has been doing a lot of work and has been recognized for the work that you've done in the circular economy. So thank you very much for joining us. Liu Deshan, chairman and secretary of the Party Committee of China's Energy Conservation and Environmental Protection Group. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here this morning. Eric Solheim, the executive director at the UN Environment Program. Uh, thank you, Eric, for being here with us. And Fike Sebsama, CEO and CMD of Royal DCM. Thank you very much for joining us here this morning. Privaini, let me start by asking you, as a young entrepreneur who's looking at the tangible advantages from a circular economy, what is the, the drivers, what is it going to take from a policy perspective, from a business perspective, to get this moving? Um, thanks, Shireen. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, sort of before answering that question, what I wanted to lay out was, as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, sort of what are the pillars that we see that either are changing or require change, a combination of both. Um, and obviously, the first one is, uh, is technology. We're, that's always sort of seen as the, the disrupted new technologies uh, bring changes in, um, in industries. The second one, in my view, uh, are their business models. I think business models are changing, particularly in the waste uh, and recycling sector. What's really interesting is waste by design um, is created locally, so it, mm. it allows for distributed business models. Um, it allows for creating local manufacturing sectors, local economies, um, you know, sort of which is the opposite of a lot of the centralized mm -hmm. manufacturing that, that we see. The third pillar that I think of that requires um, constant innovation is finance and investment. Yeah. Uh, because I think sustainability creates value. There's just absolutely no doubt about that. The question is over what time frame. There are a lot of conversations that are being had about that, mm -hmm. you know, not just in this Davos, but um, in prior years as well. I think it's just this ongoing effort of making sure that there is enough capital that cares about creating mm. value in the long term and cares about companies that last for the next 100 years, mm -hmm. not the next five. Um, the fourth pillar, which kind of builds on that, is policy. Um, and where policy can be really helpful is actually creating drivers and enabling nascent industries and allowing for some of this behavior that is, that is focused on the long term rather than short term. Mm. I mean, it's always cheaper to dump something mm. in the landfill uh, but it's not better in the long run. It's not cheaper in the long run. So I think pricing these externalities is something that policy does well. And then the fifth and final one, which is actually really interesting to me, is consumer behavior. Yes. Um, and I think just changing consumer behaviors, um, that some of it happens inherently. For example, um, as a millennial, something that's really interesting to me is how uh, values are at the heart of what drive uh, millennials, not necessarily just economics or affordability. It's truly values. Um, and sharing just an anecdote, and then I'll sort of um, end. Uh, in our businesses, when I started Blue Oak, it was really an e-waste recycling company. Mm. Um, you know, we re extracted precious metals from e-waste. I think what's been fascinating is the amount of interest that we've gotten from the luxury goods industry, uh, because their consumers really care about uh, you know not wearing uh, a wedding band that was mined uh, and you know. 50 people died in the process, right? Yeah. They really care about those values um, in, in their purchasing mm. decisions. And I think that's feeding back into what's become a key driver for us 
is trying to tap into those values and not just being a manufacturing company or a technology company, mm. but a consumer-focused company. Well, thank you so much, Praveeni, uh, for laying out the context for the conversation that we want to have this morning. I want to pick up on one of the pillars that you talked about. And uh, Jasper Broden, let me put that point to you. From a policy perspective, what do you believe are the imperatives today to ensure that we actually realize the gains and the advantages of creating the circular economy? So I, I think the, and beyond um, subsidies from governments. Okay, that was my proposal. <laughs> otherwise, so um, good. No, I, I think everybody, uh, or companies, organisations have to start with themselves and their commitment to what I think you expressed also to the long-term development. Um, IKEA being rooted in a, uh, in the deep forest of uh, southern Sweden. Uh, has part of its culture that ways this is in. So that's why the flat packs, that's why a lot of the innovation that has come over 75 years uh, with the company. Um, but we are at the point also where we realize, and in the dialogue we have with our consumers, that we need to be the champions for our consumers. Mm. They, the insights are growing. I can witness it's not only uh, the luxury brands, but it's uh, people in general are educated, they're uh, caring. And we are as well. So we see ourselves as uh, a champion for how we can find ways and make it possible for people. So the policy uh, starts with ourselves, for sure. So what is it that you've done within IKEA to ensure uh, that you do see better utilization, that you do cut down on waste? What are the, the key things that you've been able to do? Well, over the uh, history of uh, IKEA and the recent history also, I think a lot of focus, uh, uh, which is natural in a way, you start with what you can control yourself. Um, so there has been uh, a lot of activities within IKEA to find better, smarter designs, make it possible for products to be uh, not only designed uh, to put together, but how do you separate uh, uh, products? Because uh, circularity is a design question uh, mm. that goes across. And recently we are uh, at the stage where we're testing and trying many things. We are testing to buy back uh, products. In mm. Japan we have a big test where we're buying back sofas, mattresses and more. Uh, we're testing different ways of using the uh, network of all our stores and distribution as a reversed flow. Um, but we lack a couple of components, uh, uh, which is then something why we are here, to reach out to other stakeholders in society, because we can't do all of it on our own. No, we need, we need much more collaboration. Uh, Eric, let me ask you then, from a policy perspective, and you know, IKEA here talking about the initiatives that they've been able to, uh, to take forward individually as a corporation. Praveni gave us some ideas as well. From a policy perspective, what is, it, what is the ask or the expectation from governments? Mainly, I think, regulations, uh, also, also research <coughs> and, and, and driving the change. But I think we need a broad theory of change, which is basically what we heard here. And you, you said it well, but let me put it in some other words. When you see rapid change for the environment, but basically on any other areas, three components come together. One, citizens. Mm. Citizens must be mobilized and put pressure on business and politics, otherwise nothing works. Those are the consumers, the voters, the supporters. You, you need them. And when there is a strong push from society, it's, it creates miracles. Secondly, you need governments to regulate markets, to set direction, to put up the vision, uh, to mobilize, to make platforms. And thirdly, you need the private sector because nearly mm. all the new innovations, the new technologies, the new business practices will come from the mm. private sector. These three combined is a formidable force. Mm. On the second aspect of governments, you know, what is the experience at this point in time? How much of this is now a top priority for governments around the world in being able to address this challenge? Let me narrow into one area where we have been particularly active in the last year, which is plastics. I mean, we see the enormous, horrendous plastic pollution into the oceans. Every citizen on the world understands we need to change. Yeah. We will have the same weight of plastic as the weight of fish by 2050 mm. if we don't change. Yeah. So we need to change. Well, I mean, we have worked with a number of African governments. Uh, Kenya, for instance, they just prohibited plastic bags. Uh, it was a brave decision. They mm. were in doubt. They thought maybe the Kenyan people are not ready for it, mm. but they did it, and surprise, surprise, people were very much in favor, mm. and we see immediate results. I had a very good conversation, which I think links into this with President Kagame of Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, I will claim that Rwanda is now the cleanest place on planet Earth. Really? Yeah. Really? Not, not, not even Japan or Switzerland <clears throat> can, can compare. You don't see one paper on the streets, not one chocolate paper, ice cream paper on the streets of Rwanda, not the chewing gum, no, nothing. How did that miracle happen? Well, it came from the president, from President Kagame. He said, uh, 
every Rwandan historically kept clean at home. Mm. That's normal. Nearly all Rwandans also kept clean in their own garden. Mm. What we needed to do was to take that attitude to the society at large yeah. and of course establish systems so that it was possible for people to keep clean. And what Rwandans now tell me is, yes, it started with the President Kagame, mm. but now it's gone into our blood. Yeah. We don't simply don't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, that's a good point that you make, and congratulations to Rwanda. You know, that's a wonderful story that you've shared with us. And I think it does come down to political leadership. Absolutely. And we're seeing that in India as well with Prime Minister Modi, uh, you know, and the Swachh Bharat campaign that he's launched there. So hopefully uh, this will be a top priority item for most governments. But let me ask you about what you're doing in China. And uh, from a policy perspective, what are the things that have worked? What hasn't worked? Uh, China does uh, 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 attach a, a lot of importance to policies, and China has uh, 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 make a lot of uh, policies, laws uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the uh, uh, recycling uh, economy to uh, try our best to uh, have more and more uh, used uh, stuffs to to be. Uh, 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 reused mm -hmm. are, for example, the the uh, the uh, policies to encourage the getting back the metals uh, and the valuable uh, materials from the used cars yeah. from the e-waste. Uh, there are some uh, 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 progress in this period in, in this field, but still not enough uh, policies uh, uh, encourage uh, incentives. Uh, it is uh, important for the business model. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, uh, if, if economic, economically uh, yeah. uh, not possible, it's, it's not successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So fiscal incentives are necessary to basically nurture mm -hmm. uh, uh, businesses within this system. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, like the uh, the policy to uh, just uh, I think it's last year uh, okay. uh, published to encourage people. To classify the uh, garbage, okay, uh, those type of uh, policies and the incentives to uh, uh, by the local government to uh, uh, encourage uh, public or private business to uh, uh, give them more uh, uh, favorable treatment for, for example, lower price of right. land, right, uh, those and tax uh, refunded, those sure. type of policies to. To encourage. Uh, encourage. Mm. Excellent. Uh, let me end on the policy issue with a point of view from you before we move on to the other issues. Right. Well, let's first define the issue. The issue is that we consume more and more, although we become more efficient, we still use more of our scarce raw materials in the world. And that will continue to increase. So we have a so-called shortage, artificial shortage of materials and we create a huge pile of waste. Now, do we have a real shortage of molecules in this world? Mm. That is not true, um, because it's not true that at night uh, people from Mars are stealing our <laughs> molecules. All molecules <laughs> remain on Earth. The only thing is we get the molecules, if I take uh, a lot of metals, we take them out of Africa, they are well organized yes. in mines. We take them out of the mines, we put them in our mobile phones, we throw it away, and we mix it with all kinds of other garbage. And by the way, we bring it back to Africa. Um, <laughs> that is what society does, and we dump it there. The circular now, economy. <laughs> exactly. And uh, this is the so-called circular economy, but not really circular. Yes. Because, uh, and it is Jesper's point, we should design differently mm. our whole supply chain. Mm. And if we design that differently and think up front yeah. that we don't want to have it ended up in Africa mm. mixed with all kinds of other mm. ingredients. Mm. But think smart, then we can prevent and recycle it endlessly if we do that smart. Now, for example, take the biggest, and you mentioned that, the biggest um, landfill um, uh, activities in the United States, that is carpets. Mm. Carpets are made out of many materials. When the carpets are ready, uh, and you don't use them anymore, you dump them somewhere in mm. the US and you use it for landfill. It is almost impossible to split all the different materials. It's right. very costly. It's not well designed mm. to make it only out of one material because then you could recycle it. And what we have done, amongst others, is developing carpets out of one single material. So you don't need to dump it, 
you can easily put it in the machine again and uh, make a new carpet out mm. of that. Uh, Niaga, we call it. If you say it in the reverse way, you see again. Yes. That is uh, a way of, of looking uh, to carpets. The next step is, and you discussed it also, are the consumers really interested in mm. this? Have the consumers a mindset that they yes. like it? We can, the millennials more. Um, it's changing also. However, I think we need to build in also a stronger financial, maybe economic mm. incentive. And why, for example, carpets? Why should you own a carpet? Maybe you just rent the carpet. Mm. And if the manufacturer of the carpet can use your carpet mm. as an input, then you could say, rent the carpet. Don't buy any carpets mm. in the rest of your life anymore. Just rent it. And with those kind of models, you already built in an economic incentive. You built in a consciousness with the consumers that they maybe don't own the stuff, but they will own the stuff collectively in the yes. world and recycle it. I think you've raised a very important point, Praveen. Let me ask you to comment on that. Uh, you know, the imperative of shared platforms to ensure that the circular economy grows uh, and grows meaningfully, how significant of a development is this? Yeah, no, actually, um, it's something that I, I care very deeply. I mean, <clears throat> I think it's the uberification of everything, yes. right? Um, I, I think part of it actually requires sort of rethinking what we when we think of the circular economy, what's at the heart of it? Is it just recycling? Is it reuse? To me, sort of the clearest definition in my mind is the most efficient use of resources, yes. which can happen through the recycle, refurb, reuse kind of cycle. It can also happen by having multiple uses of the same resource as the sharing economy or the renting economy, you know, as, as demonstrated. Uh, particularly on the on the sharing and renting economy, I think what's really interesting and how it ties into waste or, or reduction of waste is if you look at a lot of um, historical businesses, if you mm. look at cars, when Ford made cars, they were made to last. And yes. then the innovation in cars yes. will make cars to break, right? And the same thing we've sort of heard from Apple mm. that, you know, they're making phones slower, um, perhaps to sell more phones, who, who knows? Mm. But the, um, the interesting thing is as we move from ownership to, yes. um, to renting, to mm. leasing, mm. Uh, the same companies that were incentivized to make things break yes. will now be incentivized to make things last because yeah. they actually want those things to last as long as possible. Mm. They don't want that to go away because now you're sort of reusing that. So I think even from the waste standpoint, it'll eventually have an effect and a pretty significant one. I think those are two important points that we uh, we brought up here. One, of course, is the power of the shared economy, and the other was the aspect of uh, product life extension, which you just talked about. Uh, Jasper, you know, you want mm -hmm. to pick up on both these, and, and you I know, do. Yeah. I have to. Uh, I can't resist also commenting because I think some of the insights. I, I must just applaud the examples of also when we are taking steps in society to becoming cleaner. But that doesn't mean we have uh, solved the problem because we don't see it. So I think the, the fundamental problem that uh, FAC is onto as well is, uh, uh, is really about accepting the scale of the issue that we were part of in, mm. in consumerism. We, we, uh, we, I, for myself, didn't know about the issue about the oceans until uh, far too recently. So if it's out of sight, it, it might also be uh, something that yeah. you put in denial. So what, what I believe in, and I would like to comment on this say, I think it would be a mistake to have a one, uh, uh, one line approach to it. Because yes. as much as there are maybe companies and uh, uh, organizations who resist being part of this journey, um, I think more and more companies uh, want to be part of it and mm -hmm. want to step in. And there I think uh, uh, the debate is more about how do you resolve how do you zoom in on the potentials and not oversimplify problems? Mm. Plastic is an amazing material um, if it's handled in the right way, to the point that you can uh, you can reuse. It's it's virgin one time, but it's mm. actually something that can be reused again and again and again. And one of the major issues that we sit with today is that we don't know how to uh, resolve the technical issues on. Uh, uh, contamination. Mm. So it's technical, but when we crack that and how we can crack that together, we will be able to uh, close the loop in better ways. You did know, I answer your question at all? No, no you did not. not. No, I didn't. You did Sorry. not. <laughs> you want to give it another step? What was the question? <laughs> 
That was in my mind, sorry. Yes. Yeah. You, you were thinking of a completely different question, weren't you? You said we should be the dynamic, so I, was, uh, I lost myself. Okay, so let, yeah. let, me, let me state my question again. On the two points that were made about the sharing economy, mm -hmm. uh, as well as extending product life cycles, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what can you. companies Good. do? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, to the extension of life, uh, lifetime, I think it uh, first uh, sits with us. Uh, we're, we're a big company. We want to serve the many people. We are, we are uh, interested of people with thin wallets. There will be more people in this planet who deserve to have a lovely home, a functional home. And we take it on ourselves to be the one who provides uh, great and long-lasting solutions. Mm. But then you can say in the uh, continuous prolongation of a lifetime, how do you care for your products? How do you uh, upgrade them? How, do you also, how can we be part of stimulating ourselves uh, yes. or through any kinds of eBay platforms, etc., that yeah. uh, the IKEA products can be used over and over mm -hmm. again. So yeah, fundamentally, it sits, uh, uh, it sits with us, but then to stimulate that behavior with our consumers. Mm -hmm. And we see an increasing interest. It's, it's the new cool today is to recycle and to reuse. So we want to be part of that movement. Well, it's the new cool to recycle, but mm -hmm. I want to go back to the point that you made about a circular supply chain. Uh, and I think that throws up interesting questions uh, because it will mean disrupting the current way that our supply chains function and are organized. Uh, what are the big challenges that you foresee there? Well, if you redesign the supply chain, take carpets, but I have numerous other examples in our company, and we'll list one or two. Uh, what you're doing then is you disrupt the current industry. The carpet industry is a very well organized industry already for decades and decades mm. and works in a certain way. And if we will design it in a different way, you won't own your carpet, <coughs> you will recycle, you will not use it for landfill, you will bring it back to the same factory, you will make it out of one material, not out of many mm. materials, etc., etc. You disrupt entirely this industry. And people don't like disruptions yep. in this world. Yep. They want to keep the anchors as they have it, yep. although they don't realize if the anchors are stiff, your boat is not sailing very far. But still, you need to lift your anchors and to change your industries. And it counts for many, many industries. Because the whole concept that we had is we dig stiff stuff out of the ground, yep. we process it, we consume it, and the rest we throw away as waste. And this whole concept mm. should, be, uh, should be changing. Mm. Um, so disruption of industries is a very important uh, element. What do we do? Agriculture. There's a lot of agricultural waste. People keep it on the land, and mm. when the waste is too much, they put it into fire and create mm. uh, CO2. What we now do in the US is we take a lot of the agricultural waste. We take it off the land, yeah. we go to the farmers, and say, can we go to your land and take away your waste mm. and pay you? Is it, I beg your pardon, do you pay for our waste? Yes, we pay for your waste, and we take it away even. They think, you're God, very welcome, very welcome, good. <laughs> and we process it to new forms of green energy. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes, it's possible. But you, again, you change the way farmers operate in this case. Mm. There are numerous of those kind of examples. We need to realize less than 10%, maybe between 5 and 10%, of our total economy is a little bit circular. So <clears throat> more than 90% yeah. is it's just outside. picking it yes. out, throwing yeah. it away. Yeah. So the circularity gap, as I call it, mm. is huge, mm. but also the circularity opportunity. Yes. But people need to understand you will disrupt their well-established supply chain. Well, uh, Eric, uh, you know, to pick up on that point of how do we bridge the circular deficit, so to speak, or the circular gap, uh, capital was, was an issue that we talked about. Uh, what would be the other key challenges that you see that would come in the way of being able to capitalize on the opportunity uh, and not plug the gap? I think Feike is pointing to a very central issue. When whatever can be turned into a new business opportunity is much more likely to happen. I mean, and what he just described is to me largely the solution to the problems you have in Delhi. <laughs> because the main source of, of pollution in Delhi is not like in China, it's not coal, it's agriculture waste, mm -hmm. which is burned mm -hmm. in the neighboring states, so Haryana, U U Uttar Pradesh, etc. Farmers are burning it. Mm -hmm. Because if that can be turned into green energy, someone come to the farm and picked it mm -hmm. up 
and turn it into a new business opportunity, yeah. maybe with a government subsidy. I, I cannot tell how much economy there, there is in it. Yeah. Yeah. Then the problem will disappear and there will be a new opportunity for society mm -hmm. rather than the opposite. And if, if, you, if you allow me <coughs> one, one other thought, because we, we were talking about the sharing economy. Mm. And at the core of that is the new technical yeah. uh, opportunities. Yeah. We are partnered with Mobike, a Chinese company, which is one of the two now global leading companies in bike sharing. Mm -hmm. They, two years back, they had a shareholder value of 40,000 US dollars. Now it's something like 3 billion US dollars, mm -hmm. like, like that. They're opening in Paris this week as a soft launch. And they're, they're going all over the world. Mm. But they don't define themselves as a, as a bike company. Because the bike technology is 100 years old. Yeah. What is new is the information technology. Mm. So that in, they define themselves as an information technology company because it's the fact that you can t put, take up this one, go out in the street to Beijing and Shanghai, but very soon in any street yeah. in Europe, you just use GPS, figure out where is the nearest bike, then you open the bike with your, with your mm. phone, you take it to your grandmother or to your workplace, and you leave it there. Uh, uh, it's a yeah. completely new way of operating yeah. society, but at the core is the new technologies, and they can be applied in so many other areas. Yeah, and I think that is at the heart of what we're talking about, uh, Pravini. So, you know, when we talk about disruptive digital technologies, uh, being able to aid the, the, the circular economy and perhaps bridge the gap that we were just talking about, whether it's 3D printing, connected devices, uh, you know, what we just heard here uh, from, from a sharing perspective, uh, what, what what do you see as being the drivers from a technology perspective as we go forward? Mm -hmm. So um, I actually want to, on the technology point before directly answering your question, I want to sort of tie in your earlier point about supply chains because that's sort of a, a really interesting uh, aspect where technology can have a really, uh, really critical role. Um, and, you know, I, I've wondered in the last... 12 months, if it's possible to have any conversation without bringing up blockchain. Mm. Uh, I think mm. not. But um, you know, it's, it, when you think of supply chains, one of the issues in circularity of supply chains is that there is no transparency and there is no accountability. Um, and the, the reason for that is it's so easy for things to leak towards the lowest common denominator. When you look at sort of, for example, e-waste being generated in the US, um, it, it, the issue is not often the intent of parties. It's often just where it leaks in the system yeah. and there's no way to trace that. And yeah. the same is true on the front end. People actually want to buy responsibly, but you just have no way today of, of guaranteeing sourcing and where stuff is coming from. And so when you take you know, a, a technology, it could be blockchain, it could be, it could be blockchain 2.0, it could be another iteration that mm -hmm. allows for uh, you know, immutability and, and transparency and secure sort of uh, security. But I think that th those kind of innovations in, in technology can actually allow and aid circularity. Mm -hmm. uh, back to your original question, just in terms of generally the trends of technology, I sort of think of technology, uh, the technologies that can, um, that can sort of assist circularity falling into two baskets, usually a combination of both. Mm. Uh, one is project type technologies. So you build a facility, then you build another facility. So you're sort of project oriented, you build a uh, you know, a, a new store, as, as you guys I heard are launching in India. So that's sort of yeah. the project aspect of it. The second part of it is platform technologies, right? And so, um, for, for example, there are companies in the US um, right now that are actually looking at big data in, in, in terms of being able to sort of see and track where waste is being generated, mm -hmm. you know, how companies can better manage their uh, their assets and, and where they're disposed and when they're disposed. And usually it's a combination of both. Yeah. So I think there's, those are sort of the, the vectors that I see technology development happening in. Right. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, you want to come no, in with that? I think it's a very important point and it fits with the forum, um, the fourth industrial revolution. Yes. And we should realize that we are developing technologies nowadays uh, which makes these kinds of things possible. I mean, if I look to converting agricultural waste mm. into green energy. I don't know how our yeah, chief innovation officer sitting here. Uh, seven years ago, we were discussing, is it possible, because the agricultural waste, to confirm that the green energy is technologically very complicated. Mm. Is that possible or not? And he and his people believe that is possible. Many people said, yeah. no, that is yeah. technologically impossible. We mm. can prove that to you. Still, they have proven it is possible. We have a factory in Iowa, in the US, it's working. So it is possible. So two things are happening at the same moment. We have all kinds of technology, 3D printing, biotechnology, all yeah. kinds of things which are developing, making those solutions possible. Secondly, we have the digital revolution. Mm. 
with digital revolution, which makes sharing models, mm. uh, different ownership models, different ways of administrating those yeah. things possible. If you combine those two technological developments from the digital part and from the hardcore technology part, then create solutions possible. And I think this technological angle is a very important one to this. It is a very important you angle. Guys have the technologies are available to precise the uh, the straws, the ag ag agricultural based. Uh, yes. But, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's talk about it. Um, okay. Thanks for this panel. We have, uh, can I can I interrupt I, you because before you do you, you have um, an offer that you want to make? Yeah, as before well? you shake hands, uh, <laughs> we we have uh, developed technology and uh -huh. we're interested to actually make furniture out of uh, cellulose fibers. So we have to have a. Uh, the we make discussion a three-way yes, three 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 conversation. Which is also <laughs> available. As long as you give me your e-waste. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've created a little bit of a circular economy here as well. But I want to address the issue of scale, because you know each one of us has talked about mm -hmm. uh, individually what your corporations are doing as entrepreneurs, what you're doing. But for all of this to be meaningful, for all of this to have a significant impact, it needs to be done on scale. What's the big problem that you faced as you've talked about scaling up and as if you tried to execute scaling? up on some of these initiatives that you've taken forward? Uh, just like uh, the, the, uh, the treatment of the, uh, of the uh, uh, agricultural based, the, the business model is, is uh, uh, so far is not successful. So technology, we don't have the, uh, uh, the, the uh, feasible technologies to treat the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, stoves, the uh, crops, uh, crop stocks, and even the, uh, the, the uh, manures from uh, poultry. Right. We tried several years, but uh, technology doesn't work. Uh, it, it, the business model doesn't work. Uh, we, the cost is too high, and the product we produce is just the uh, natural gas and uh, the uh, uh, fertilizers. But it's too expensive, mm. so it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Mm. The business model doesn't work. The business model doesn't work. Yes. Mm. So, you know, how do we ensure that this becomes a viable proposition? How do we drive down costs? Uh, mm. uh, you know, which is the challenge that that he's faced with. I so actually, my, my sort of point on scale was going to be around. Uh, scale is obviously in, in business models, it's in technologies. Uh, I wanted to sort of briefly touch on consumer mindset and something that would be interesting for the West to learn from a lot of Eastern economies were actually the concept of waste. My parents are Indian um, and the concept of waste, it just really doesn't exist. People truly see value in every part of, of whatever uh, product or ecosystem right. they're using. And I think that's been a part of that, that, that DNA uh, for, for generations. Um, I think that's just that sense of like you can actually extract value from, from every part of, of whatever you're using. I think what's interesting is as you have more and more people sort of going up in the middle class and, and you know, gaining wealth, whether some of those, those behaviors are actually regressing into saying it's actually, you know, it's okay to have a disposal mindset, mm. right? And so if, as we try to sort of think about achieving scale, um, in addition to consume, in addition to technology, and in addition to to business model, how do you sort of scale back this uh, this disposal mindset and yeah. really sort of think about, uh, you know, we need to incentivize or penalize mm. um, both uh, creating circularity and and uh, you know deterring from. Uh, from from disposal. I would like to build on that if mm. possible and get Eric in this one, because. An essential element is that uh, waste is for free. Mm. Uh, our governmental models are like that. You can waste. You can put for free uh, CO2 into the air mm. and creating a big burden for the next generation. Mm. Now I'm working hard, mm. together with Catherine McKenna out of Canada, the Canadian environmental minister, to put a price on carbon yeah. and not make that for free. And there are many other forms of waste which we as mankind treat for free. I'm involved in another project, it's called, and look it up, the Ocean Cleanup, an initiative of a Dutch boy when he was 18 years old, he's now 22, mm. and in, at his own, mm. he's cleaning up the mess of many generations mm. and getting the plastic out of the oceans. He needs a couple of hundreds of millions of dollars. It is in the middle of the ocean, and not any government, nobody, not any consumer, feel mm. themselves responsible. He is now collecting money from philanthropists mm -hmm. in order to okay. get it done that somebody cleans up, because he said it is ridiculous that this is not being cleaned up. 
here is something, and maybe Eric can help us here, here is something wrong in our model, that we feel the freedom to create such a waste mm. burden for next generations, mm. nobody feels responsible for. Mm. Uh, absolutely, just one comment yeah. on what she said, because you described it very well, but it's not just in India. My grandparents never threw away anything in Norway. Yeah. Uh, even for my mother, it was very, very, very hard for she to throw away any food. because She felt that you, you don't do that. That's immoral. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a affront to the world's poor instead of an affront to what she had experienced in Norway during the Second World War. So she would never do it. Now, but our aim is to bring everyone into the global middle class. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then we will have, of course, uh, a huge, huge, huge issue. Uh, two thoughts about the solution. Uh, obviously, governments need to find ways to either prohibit mm -hmm. uh, or to put levies and taxes yeah. on what we don't need. That's what we do in the rest of society, and we, we need to do it here. But another avenue to the, some of the same, I think, is also the enormous opportunity now to share information. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, I think China is now ahead of Europe yes. or, or any other place when it comes to the, the mobile phone as the platform for in, uh, intervention. So that uh, internet trade in, in China is now 11 times the United, United States. So China is ahead. But on this phone, of course, you can get any information when you go into, say, IKEA. Mm. Uh, IKEA can provide all supply chain information about the furniture, make sure that it was, I mean, I know you are doing well, but that is not coming from rainforest, which is cut down, or that the, the entire supply chain is, 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 yeah. is acceptable. The customer can know. We, we are now developing, hopefully, with WWF apps, which can assist the customers in getting all these sorts of information. Not all will use it, but if 20% of the customers are using it, it has an immediate important uh, effect on the markets. Right. Uh, let me then try and get in some questions here from the audience. If you have a question, if you could raise your hands, we'll get a microphone across to you. Uh, yes, we've got one right here. Hello, my name is Carolina Sachs. I'm from Axe Foundation, Stockholm, Sweden. And I have a uh, question regarding uh, towards IKEA. Uh, I was wondering, are you prepared to rent your furniture since mm -hmm. you, you pay for the raw material once mm -hmm. and you don't want to pay for it once again? Uh, are you renting furniture already? Uh, we are not renting, but uh, rent, if you mean renting out uh, furniture renting out. to our so customers, you, so you don't we, we, we actually have uh, started to test it. Uh, so we, we, will, uh, we are at the moment where we uh, like I think all of us don't have one solution for the problem. So what we decided to do is that we will speed up our journey towards mass uh, circularity. If the last uh, dec decades has been about mass consumerism, how can we get to a point of uh, mass uh, circularity? So we're testing rental solutions. It seems at this moment, even if it's a bit early, that it's very different depending on which city and place you are, the interest is. In some, in some areas, what we discovered, for example, in London, uh, there are a lot of people who commute, and they are not interested in building with passion a, a second home, for example. So rental there is uh, more interesting, and in some other areas not. But regardless of the, uh, the way we serve you as a customer, if it's renting or if it's buying, for us still, the same topic remains at the end of a life cycle. How do we close the loop? What type of technology? Well, I'm, I'm convinced, like uh, uh, my friends on the stage here, that uh, information technology will help us but ultimately it comes down to ficus molecules, I think. So disruptive, uh, also production concepts will be part of the solution, where we can bring maybe production and reproduction back closer to the markets. And some of those ideas exist. Some of them are being tested also in our uh, ecosystem. But uh, at this moment, to the dialogue, the, the curves doesn't match any uh, uh, yet. And the scaling will actually be one of the ways with guts and incentives to be able to, to move that uh, with the higher speed. It's going to happen, but it's moving too slow. More questions here for our panelists? We'll, yes. Oh, it's right here at the back. Hi, I'm Deep. I'm a global shaper. And uh, yeah. uh, I, I just want to run a story by you. So my work takes me to the remote villages in India, where I see there's no waste generation. Absolutely no ways. The communities have been living sustainably. Now, when you start trading up these uh, communities, waste comes in. So children start buying uh, noodles. So they start buying toffee wrappers. And there's some plastic that gets generated. Go to a city, you find every trip to the supermarket produces so much waste. 
And then this is just India. We are on the growth curve. And if you look at Indian and African uh, countries, we are going to grow. We are going to increase our waste. Mm. Now there's a developed world with uh, you know, the US and the Europe where there's already so much waste. And there's an interesting statistic uh, in the foyer there with this show that the, uh, the waste that we are producing is nowhere even closer to what US and Europe are doing right now. Mm. So there are already that mistakes that have been done. How can we learn from those mistakes and not do the same things? Because then ultimately we see that this waste yeah. is going to get generated. Knowing that it's there, what can we do to correct it right now rather than repent in the future? Yeah, so how do we do things differently? What do we learn from the experience of the developed world? How do we not repeat the same mistakes? I'll come to you first and then I'll, then I'll come to you. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, and maybe not everybody is used to the concept of the shapers. I found it important that we have shapers, young people, millennials sitting here and joining the discussion with all kinds of global world leaders, CEOs of big companies and governmental <laughs> leaders, because we, most, a lot of people here in Davos are 50, 60 years plus, <laughs> to be honest. And they discuss shaping a world so they're they Davos might not now. be part of. <laughs> and those people will be part of the world we will be shaping. So I found it important that they are here. Uh, but indeed, uh, the advantage of countries like India is that, please, don't copy exactly the West. Do make a leapfrog and install systems in a different way like you did in your telephone network. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the fixed landlines in telephones, you don't build that in India, and why should you? I mean, you immediately leapfrog to the next phase. Yeah. And you should do that in, in many areas. On top of that, we should realize that consumers are still working a little bit against this whole trend. And I think the awareness is important. Don't we all love this small packaging of shampoos, or think it's, it's easy to travel, and all those adorable small things. We like small things quite a bit. That creates more packaging, more waste than ever before. Yeah. So we need to realize in our consumption pattern, mm. um, and here, to be honest, also India should learn, um, but it boils down to price, right? I mean, a sachet of shampoo uh, is, is accessible and affordable at that price point to it, a majority of Indians, which would otherwise not be able to access a large bottle of shampoo. So, hey, you, so made, it, yeah. you made a very good, very important point. Shampoo manufacturers would say, and, and I'm in the board of one, uh, so uh, they would absolutely say, uh, we make it affordable in the small such as too many. And I totally agree with that. And I totally agree with the people who buy it in small pieces. The only thing is we need to think very carefully about how, how we package, package and how yeah. we bring that yeah. to the people. Yeah. And maybe as a refill or whatever. Otherwise, we create an even bigger, bigger burden problem. of waste. And this guy, Boyan Slot, who's cleaning up the oceans on behalf of all of us, will be busy, busy to the end <laughs> of his life. <laughs> and healthy. he's only 22. Yes, go ahead, Eric. No, I mean, we are working a lot on plastic, and of course, these will come in different sort of plastic bottles. I, I think we, we, need, we need to, number one, there are a, a number of products we simply don't need, which we can abolish. I mean, a clear example is the microbees, which was just uh, abolished in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, and many other governments. Are, uh, we don't need them. Mm -hmm. There's no purpose. They can be easily be replaced. Let's just, the government can just stop it. Straws. Do we need straws? The average North American is using 600 straws a year. And an enormous amount of them are ending up in the, um, uh, in the oceans. And there is no real need. Then there is a lot of plastic products we do need, say, to, cons to preserve our, our food longer or for bottles or whatever. Mm. But they, and, and maybe the, also even the, uh, the shampoo bottles, but they, it goes, be, in my view, beyond any logic that they cannot be made in a biodegradable and a much better way. By the way, Danone and Nestlé mm. just announced that by 2020, all their bottles will be 100% biodegradable. And even maybe more interesting, they also said that that technology will be given out for free to anyone mm. who takes an interest. Well, they will not yeah. make it a competitive advantage, but yeah. I, I make it a public, global public good. Amazing. Uh, let's look into it happening. And then, of course, there is a huge number of plastic products of a character we can only recycle to make, say, the cars lighter, which is very good because then they consume yeah. less, less energy. And but we need emission. to separate yes. something we don't need, let's get rid of it, something we don't need to replace, and something we need to recycle. 
Excellent. And with that, we're pretty much out of time here on this panel. So let me uh, start by getting each of you to give us one idea for 2018 that you hope, whether it's a government or a corporation or uh, the social sector, that you would like one single idea that you would most like to see go forward in 2018. Eric, I'll start with you. Uh, sharing. Uh, I spoke about sharing, sharing of, of bikes. It's taken on like a prairie, prairie, fi prairie f uh, fire. Uh, because there is a demand from consumers and they can handle it. And I'm sure we can share in so many other, other areas. Okay, Pravaini. I would say that if, if every uh, consumer, stakeholder, entrepreneur, business leader, government, uh, you know, service, uh, anyone in the government sector, I think we can all sort of move to really embracing intergenerational thinking. Mm. I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, I think uh, to just a, a segue to the, to the previous question that ties in, is you know a hundred years ago you know maybe dumping arsenic into the ground yeah. was completely acceptable people didn't think about it and yeah. yet it's ludicrous to think that that ever happened because it affects us in our lifetime and in our you know yeah. it affects us i think expanding that circle to um to sort of our, our, the next generations not just of humans but of, of all living beings of the planet mm. um i think is really important and there was a quote that was sort of um uh, made on, on one of the panels yesterday, which I want to sort of maybe end with, is um, in a losing planet, there can be no winning company. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that, you know, just it's, it's really stuck with me. Uh, and I think that's a very valid point that you make. So let me uh, get your idea for 2018. One idea. Yes, one oh, idea. this is going to be so <laughs> difficult. But I think, I think um, my idea would be uh, on a different uh, uh, maybe horizon. I, I think um, my idea would be to find platforms for sharing solutions, not only ideas. Because I think what we have witnessed here only in a couple of minutes is that uh, there is an awareness in the, in the world mm. that is increasing about the problem. So we have to stimulate more knowledge in that. But there is enough awareness and enough willingness to act. So if we can also spend less time in maybe uh, pondering about the problems and more time in looking at great solutions that mm. has been talked about here and see how can we scale that and how can we share, like yes. some of the examples, the, the solutions. So the idea from my side would be uh, platforms for sharing good solutions. Excellent. Your idea for 2018. I think, uh, I hope that uh, uh, it's get better uh, the, for the uh, public to uh, improve their awareness, mm. who have more uh, understanding on recycling economy. That is good for the public, for individuals. And I will end with you. Appreciate you quote me. The literal quote I used is, you cannot be successful in a world that fails. And I appreciate you quote that. And um, what I would say, be provocative, be disruptive, mm. and go home, discuss your business, look to your supply chain, and don't take it for granted mm. the way it is designed now, and try to disrupt your own business before other people will do it. Well, I think that is the perfect note to end this conversation on disrupt, collaborate, and share. That, I think, are the themes that have emerged uh, from this uh, conversation that we've had today to ensure that we do move to a circular economy, which currently is 10%, but hopefully uh, in the next five or 10 years, we see that number improve dramatically. Thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you to all of our guests for so joining much. us here for this Thank morning. Thank you very Thank much. You.